Good evening. This is Mae Brussel. It's uh, August the 24th, 1980, and this is tape number 455. These are made on tape cassettes and distributed in various places around the country and overseas, and therefore we number them each week. I'm going to pass most of the important news of the week, the uh, various murders of important witnesses, airplane crashes, uh, problems in Bolivia, the increased narcotics trade, the removal of the drug agents from Bolivia, the foreign coups, the trials in Korea, the important trial in Korea, um, the police state, the mass arrest there. I'm going to pass all of that up to do two weeks of broadcasting on Ronald Reagan, and hopefully uh, maybe two more weeks after that on Billy Carter, and maybe another week on the independent candidates. Uh, my purpose of doing this is to share information that I have, uh, 17 years research on uh, Ronald Reagan and the other candidates basing the behavior and the contacts they have today with people that I have studied and researched for the past years. Uh, I have no intention of telling you to vote against Ronald Reagan or for Ronald Reagan. I simply want to share, as I say, some of the information that I have. I couldn't possibly share it all in two hours. And having the experience of Ronald Reagan as governor in California from 1966 to 19. 74, there are very many personal and pleasant experiences that happened to people during his administration. And uh, the man, I believe, is a total fraud and a front and uh, put in by the public relations agencies. And it's a tragedy that he's gotten as far as he has without being exposed. So I'm not saying vote for him or vote against him. I just want to tell you about him and all that I say about him you can get from uh, the sources that I print out that accompany these tapes if you write to me. In my own personal experience and frame of reference, it seems impossible that people like Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan or Lyndon Johnson could ever become president of the United States. I guess it seems impossible because we were never taught about McKinley or Coolidge or Harding or Herbert Hoover, and I never did study the intricacies or the stupidities or the mediocrities of the people who were president. We looked up to them and believed that they were the best selection for the country and didn't do research in those days. Not very many people did. Or if they did, the books were obscure and not known and uh, simply faded away. There isn't much critical about these creeps that should have been taught in the textbooks and classrooms while we were growing up. Uh, Ronald Reagan is a California phenomena, uh, just as Richard Nixon is, and it juggles my mind to believe that people on the East Coast with uh, the high financing of Wall Street, the multinational banks, the large institutions of education of Harvard and Yale and Princeton and the top ten universities or state universities, it's hard to believe that they would accept such jokers as were produced in California. California, the state of Richard Nixon, Earl Warren, a clown of the First Order who built himself up to a prestigious position as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and instrumental in concealing the murder of the President of the United States, John Kennedy, and linking his name, the Warren Commission, to that terrible event. This is the state where a financier and inventor like Howard Hughes can be kidnapped and drugged and destroyed while his empire is built of billions of dollars for profit and control, and nobody can see a person using that name Howard used for many years. It's the state of Walt Disney and the public relations offices like J. Walter Thompson and various large public relations firms selling you this tomorrow land, this future land, this a perfect little town where there's the automated Abraham Lincoln and a lot of facade that has nothing to do with the past as it was or the real world as it is today. It's the state of the motion pictures and television, the entertainment shows, the documentaries, the many documentaries, the falsified histories, a place of the Charles Manson era of Altamont, of Stanford Research, Mind Control, Jonestown, Mass Murders, La Costa with Mo Dallas, Randolph Hearst and the Hearst Castle, the phony king of San Simeon, 
Lockheed, Lytton Industries, Rockwell, space shuttles, planning tomorrow on the space when they've polluted planet Earth, all of this coming from California. As I say, I can't understand how the East Coast, with a classical education in humanities and literature, and what we assume would be a culture, a training or opportunity of prep schools and universities to have these people out here representing the entire country and representing the United States across the earth while people laugh at us and shake their heads in disbelief. I don't know. I know the Mellons and the DuPonts, the Morgans, the Vanderbilts, the Rockefellers, the Auchenschlosses, the Astors must have been terribly corrupt, and they were individually, but I can't imagine them handing even to their own children or their generation candidates for office such as we have produced out here in California. I sometimes think that the resurrection of the Titanic is the desire to bring back the old society or the class, the one that sunk when it met the iceberg. And I can't imagine why the Eastern establishment allowed Tom Dewey running for president with Earl Warren as vice president at that time, uh, making contacts with Lucky Luciano and organized crime and the, the mob in Italy and incorporating them into the OSS and into the CIA. And I can't believe how easy it was for West Point and Annapolis to take their generals and admirals and incorporate them with organized crime and expect to be able to rule the world that way. The baby they produced out of this ridiculous marriage of military strength and dictatorship in this country that we spread all over the world and disguised as democracy. What that marriage produced were people like Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, Jimmy Carter, and Ronald Reagan. And what they really are doing is carrying on a large narcotic war between the various candidates for control of gambling syndicates and turf of imported narcotics that is much, much bigger than many of the minerals and uh, commodities that they deal and trade every single day. I study history because it is interesting, and I'd like to read about these characters and how they got where they did and how close we are to having total idiots and front men make vital decisions for our health and our minds, for the vegetation and everything that's precious on this planet we put in their hands. Spencer and Roberts uh, was a public relation firm in California, and it was their task to present Ronald Reagan as a person that the Republicans could use in 1966 for governor. He had been an actor from 1937 to 66. And they described in a book called Dancing Bear, we had to overcome three things, Regan's inexperience, the actor bit, and his lack of knowledge of state government. We decided not to compete with Governor Brown, that's Pat Brown, Jerry Brown's father, who was governor of California in 1966. We decided not to compete with him on a knowledge level of specific issues. We admitted Ronald Regan was not a professional politician Regan pursued a campaign of bland generalities leaning on such nebulous concepts as morality. He's still doing that. That was in 1964, 1965. They ran that campaign and they've used it ever since. Regan was prone to lurch, they said, into blunders, but with an acquired politician's charm and agility in extricating himself. Ronald Reagan was asked about nuclear uh, energy and solar energy when he was in New Hampshire a few years ago, and he responded, I've been standing in the sun all day and my feet are still freezing. That was his explanation about solar energy. He also gave a speech in Philadelphia where he was talking about third world countries, and on nine separate occasions in that speech, he talked about third world war instead of third world. And they asked him afterwards why he made that mistake. And he said, it must be Freudian. Perhaps I've been thinking too much about Russia. And that is exactly the answer of the mystery of Ronald Reagan and the history of Ronald Reagan. Because if you study him and put him in a time slot, he is only one of many people whose sole goal on earth is to fight Russia at any expense. Dean Rusk was on the Monterey Peninsula a year ago, and I mentioned it on my radio tapes in 1979, 
That same week, we had out here Helmar Schmidt from Germany, Alexander Haig, Henry Kissinger, Mr. Schultz, Mr. Packard from the Hoover Institute, and Mr. Bechtel. Uh, you, the gentleman, Mr. Packard from Hewlett Packard, and Bechtel have homes here at Pebble Beach. And Dean Rusk was speaking at Monterey Institute of Foreign Studies, and he said in quotes, the influence of presidents in foreign policy is discounted. In all my years of negotiating treaties and agreements before the Senate for ratification, I never heard anyone say, let's get out the party platform and see what it says on any matter relating to foreign policy. The presidents go in a succession, but foreign policy is continuous. That was Dean Rusk speaking. Uh, as a historical background for Ronald Reagan and how the continuity of the foreign policy goes on no matter what he says or how he says it. I want to refer to a compilation of facts and information that has just been put together by Charles Spears in Texas. He is the most serious student of history than I can think of in the United States today, and that is really quite a compliment. And he's the president of a bank in Sherman, Texas, and he has occupied his time and energy, similar to the way I have been trying to do it, to pinpoint the dates and events that have brought us such mediocre people and so many weapon systems and so much pain and suffering across the earth. And Charles Spears just compiled in a, a set of pages, it's a self-published document about 150 pages and I'm going to get the price from him of what it would cost for postage and duplicating this so that you students of history who want it can have it. It's 150 pages and dates, the most important dates of history long before there was known a Ronald Reagan, before there was a Reagan and brought right up to date. On the cover he explains for research use only from 1914 to 1980 Chronology and Evolution of the Kami Gonna Get You Inquisition by Implosion of Power Mad Secret Team Forces. How we subverted the U.S. Constitution, how it was achieved, four presidential elections controlled by assassins. 1964, that was Lyndon Johnson. 1968, Richard Nixon. 1972, Richard Nixon. And 1980, Jimmy Carter. All of them with links to the assassination of President John Kennedy, the murder of Senator Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and at least 1,000 other murders that could be easily detailed that they have known and covered up. But we're talking about elections now. Charles puts on the cover of his book, 17 Years of Research Here and for Future Aid to Histographic Perception. This is to counteract the cover-up and Nixon's Burger Court saying, wait 75 years while the slate is wiped clean. And then he has a quotation of Shakespeare, let me speak to the yet unknowing world how these things came about. So shall you hear of carnal, bloody, and unnatural acts of accidental judgments casual slaughters of death put on by cunning and forceful cause. All of this I can truly deliver. And deliver he does in his book. But I'm going to share with you the first page of this chronology of subversion because it is the background of Ronald Reagan's cabinet, the Hoover Institute, the think tank that's in Palo Alto is the force, it is the ideology, it is the muscle, it is the weapon system that is using Ronald Reagan as their front to wage that third world war that Reagan referred to nine times in a speech in Philadelphia. Charles begins August 1914 when World War I starts. The Kaiser of Germany, the King of England, the Tsar of Russia were all cousins. The intellectuals said what the world needs is a good war to purify the bloodstream of mankind. By 1918, an entire generation of French, English, and Russians were wiped out. The U.S. lost millions. Some 20 million were killed, and he refers to Barbara Tuckman's book, The Guns of August. By 1918, Russia was in shambles. The Tsar and their family, he puts in, were murdered by the Bolsheviks. I don't believe they were. We disagree on that point, but not on very many points. In 1919, Herbert Hoover began a war against Russia. He held, and this is documented, billions of dollars in his own private pocket of timber and oil concessions 
in Russia, and when the communists came in, they took those billions of dollars from Herbert Hoover. The book The Great Conspiracy by Michael Sayers and Kahn refers to the effort of Herbert Hoover to become, he was Secretary of Commerce and President of the United States, and he literally bankrupt this country and brought it to a depression, taking at least 32 million or more documented in congressional hearings to fund the czarist Polish troops to get ready for World War II, hoping to reclaim the fortune that was lost at the time of the Russian Revolution. He chronicles the year of 1920 when the Versailles reparations were on the brink of anarchy and how in 1922, that's the year I was born, Henry Luce started Time magazine, his propaganda machine. In 1923, Hitler was riding Mein Kampf. In 1922, Aristotle Onassis was in Argentine, beginning his tobacco sale of hashish and marijuana and narcotics that he could compound into a fortune and build uh, by the oil tankers. Howard Hughes was 17 in 1922, that's when his father died, and Noah Dietrich from the uh, Doheny oil people helped take over the tool bit that Howard's father invented that controlled the drilling of oil around the world. 1923, President Harding got his poison in San Francisco, another California event. Uh, because of the Teapot Dome scandal, he was poisoned in San Francisco. And in the 1920s, Herbert Hoover's files that belonged to the Tsar were brought to Stanford University, and in 1920s, Reinhard Galen, the chief of Hitler's Eastern Division Intelligence, who later formed our CIA, began working with the German army and settling agents east and west of Germany so that when war was declared against Russia, all of Europe would belong to Germany and would collapse instantly as the German armies moved in, and that's why France lasted 24 hours and Poland fell under and all the other countries gave up to Hitler immediately. They had been infiltrated and trained, and uh, he continues with J. Edgar Hoover's role as director of the FBI. He began in 1924, and of course, Hubert Hoover was working with Adolf Hitler, with Interpol, with Heydrich and Carlton Brunner and Nazi war criminals until we were bombed at Pearl Harbor, and he was told uh, to stop corresponding during the war years. He was sympathetic to Adolf Hitler before and after the war and with the Nazis that were brought over here after the war to continue their attempt to control the world and to take Russia again. And out of the repository of the Himmler diaries, the list of people in Great Britain that were to be killed by Adolf Hitler and so forth, out of the Hoover Towers came people through uh, the advertising agencies in California, as I say, J. Walter Thompson and Spencer and Roberts and so forth, that created these monkeys like Nixon and Reagan who would control the White House and the Pentagon and they would be the front men, uh, the supposedly packaged strong anti-communist uh, getting the weapon systems going that keep this state very well supplied. One out of three people in California, I think, is dependent upon warfare and weapon systems and related operations. Well, Ronald Reagan had direct links all of his career uh, since the 60s. The very people that put him into power, and I'll go into them as much as time allows this week, and I'll continue next week, with those people from the far right who murdered the Kennedy brothers, and Robert Kennedy was killed in Los Angeles and was covered up by Reagan's gang. He had links to the FBI, the CIA, and counterintelligence. He was the Western image, the cowboy image, the public relations good guy chasing the Indians and so forth that was projected to this country as it was done by Hitler in Germany, and I'll go into that. Uh, Reagan was instrumental in instigating mind control in this state. The years 1966 to 1974 were the years of Vacaville, the SLA, the Zebra Trials. And I'll run down some of the violences that Reagan was behind. The Garden Plot, the plans to take over America and turn into a fascist state, his Operation uh, Chaos, and so forth. It wasn't a peaceful or a quiet time while he was governor, and I don't know why he's protected so much by the news media because of these interconnecting links of him to all of these operations and the people behind him to these operations. The most important thing to know about Ronald Reagan, I believe, is that he is not his own man. This always comes as a shock 
Harry Truman obviously wasn't, neither was war-weary General Eisenhower or Lyndon Johnson or Nixon. But as I say, growing up, it took a long time to realize that a powder puff and a package of three-by-five cards uh, with titles and cues could get a guy like Ronald Reagan up to the position where he could become president of the United States. Reagan was once asked about the controversial Senate One bill that was uh, being presented. This is back in 1975. They were trying to get that through, and uh, the criminal code that was so strict at the height of Watergate. And a reporter asked him, Governor, how do you feel about the Senate bill? And Regan said, Senate Bill 1? Wait a minute. Uh, do you mean a California bill or a federal bill? And they said, the Senate Bill 1. And he said, I'm drawing a blank. I don't remember. It's very upsetting. And he said, I must have been on the airplane too long. And then he added, if you would just give me a little while, about three more minutes, it might come to my mind. I'm sure in three minutes he would pull out his little card catalog. But the front man between the Pentagon, between the Hoover Institute and Ronald Reagan, of course, were men in Los Angeles, Henry Salvatore, who I'll go into his background at working for Lytton Industries and the oil uh, geologist down in Los Angeles, Holmes Tuttle, a car dealer, and Cy Rubel from Union Oil and the public relations firm of Spencer Roberts. They were hired to groom him in 1965 to run against Pat Brown, and they called in the Behavior Science Corporation, uh, the psychologists from this group, to train Ronald Reagan on to the issues so that he'd be familiar with the issues in California. The public relations firm sent him to the Los Angeles-based Behavior Science Corporation to prepare him to learn the issues in the state of California. Reverend McBurney, a very rabid part of that Christian crusade, created the slogan for uh, Ronald Reagan, the Creative Society, and they would present him as a citizen, politician, honest Midwesterner, the very part he played in his movies. Neil Reagan, Ronald Reagan's brother who lives in California, said in quotes, I sold Dutch not as my brother, but like a piece of soap. It was Neil Reagan in 1964 who sent Ronald Reagan to see Barry Goldwater, and in 1965, they took away the harsh image of Goldwater the conservative and decided to tone it down with Ronnie. Um, his brother also said in Detroit after Ronald got the nomination that Ronald has a soothing effect on folks. When he was governor, you know, there were riots on the campuses and all that in the beginning, but things calmed down under Ronald's administration. Everything began to simmer. People felt like things were getting better. They didn't go around with a chip on their shoulder anymore. That's Neil Regan from an advertising firm in Rancho Santa Fe. Uh, Jonathan Jackson and George Jackson and Rochelle McGee and Geronimo Pratt and the Soledad Brothers and the San Quentin Six and Angela Davis and... Bobby Hinton, a few that were murdered and are kept and locked up in jail. They're still Geronimo Pratt and Rochelle McGee are still in jail. And the six cremated the SLA by the LAPD in Los Angeles, uh, killing their own agents. Uh, there was so much bloodshed in this state and mass murders that were part of the Regan team and the counterintelligence at Isla Vista and the riots and the killing of Ruben Salazar. Uh, Brother Regan says that Ronnie had a soothing effect. Uh, the U.S. attorney, Robert Myers, killed in a parking lot in Pasadena. He was investigating some of these murders. He didn't have a soothing effect. These prisons were hell holes. People were put in solitary confinement. There was torture and drugs. Uh, it was a hard time in California when Ronald Reagan was governor, but his brother passes that off, his brother Neil, and says he remembers happy yesterdays, and I could cite for hours the harm that... Regan's group did personally up and down this state when he was the governor. Um, the public relations firm uh, sold him, and they've done it to this day. Gladwin Hill, a correspondent for the New York Times, wrote in a book about Ronald Regan, it is a myth of American politics that our electoral system puts into office the ablest men in terms of academic occupational qualifications. The system puts into office the most electable people. 
the most agile performers of the obstacle race. One of the biggest hurdles is to establish their identity, and Regan had it ready-made. He left the movie scene when the movies were bad, and he was thrown into General Electric to a large corporation where he met with heads of the corporation, traveled around the country for several years, many years, 10 years of radio for General Electric, and he went to various countries, various cities each year, and he met thousands of workers at General Electric and the heads of the corporation, so he was known visually so that when he was nominated for governor in 1966, his voice was known uh, on the radio, his movies were reruns, people knew his face. He had been touring around the country for the firm of General Electric so that there was no candidate in the scene, on the scene, who was more familiar around here than Ronald Reagan. At the time that uh, Watergate came down, the CIA was exposed for supplying a photographer's safe houses, equipment for the White House plumbers, and then uh, Tom Charles Houston began to talk, thanks to, uh, James, to John Dean, about the, the COINTEL program, and uh, the CIA, it seemed, was acting too overtly in the United States. Part of the condition of their charter was that they were not to be controlling the various facets of our life, the mind control, the medical experiments, the opening of mail, the wiretapping of phones, the photographing of us at demonstrations, and so forth. So Gerald Ford, then President of the United States, after Watergate appointed by Richard Nixon, had a commission to look into Operation Chaos, and he, it was headed by Nelson Rockefeller, the vice president, who worked with this COINTEL program also, and every member on the commission uh, was part of the intelligence operation in one way or the other. It was a question of the fox guarding the chicken house. But every one of those people on the commission had a long list of public service. Uh, no matter how close they were to the intelligence community, they were known as people who had served many, many years and had graduated Phi Beta Kappa's magnum cum laude and uh, recognized in public service and with their degrees. But on that committee, Gerald Ford appointed the Honorable Ron, Ronald Reagan, and in the Rockefeller Report, it said he got his A.B. degree from Eureka College, Illinois. In 1932, he was governor from 1966 to 1974, and he was a motion picture and television actor from 1937 to 1966. As the Public Relations Office said, it was the first time that a motion picture actor became the governor of California or went into politics in such a way. His qualifications for being on the committee were that he had served the Operation Chaos and the COINTEL program throughout California from 1966 to 1974 and sat on the very committee that was supposed to question the legality or illegality of these operations. The Rockefeller Committee was such a disaster. It was headed by David Bellin, who was on the Warren Commission, another cover-up artist. And uh, they were, as I've mentioned before on other shows, it was so bad that Senator Church also investigated the CIA activities, and then it led to the House Select Committee on Assassinations that went farther into the murder of John Kennedy and Reverend Martin Luther King. They cleverly left out the murder of Robert Kennedy because, again, it would swing back to California, to Evel Younger, the Los Angeles Police Department, to Ronald Reagan's team, and it might taint the possibility that a man that was groomed so cleverly all these years would be brought down with Watergate. Ronald Reagan's tentacles are tied about a hundred times to the Watergate people. Maybe we'll get into five or six or eight of them. But uh, he was so closely tied and created out of the same mold that it was very important to cut off the links to Ronald Reagan because too much time and money had been invested in this man. He was known nationally, as I say, through the radio, through public speaking, through his own radio talks, and he was groomed for this job. And so there wasn't any chance that Watergate was going to rub off on Reagan. He didn't attend many of those meetings in good taste. He didn't attend, and I'm sure he had good reason, because then, working on a need to know, he would be forced to make statements or open his eyes and look at the very people that put him into power, and he knows who they were. So he didn't go to hardly any meetings of the Rockefeller Committee, 
but he did sign his name to that June report in 1975. It's 10.30 now. I'm going to take a one-minute break and get back to Ronald Reagan. This is Mae Brussel in KLRB, Carmel, California. We will continue with Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, uh, really twins. Uh, when Nixon fell down into disgrace, he only moved to, right next door to David Rockefeller in New York City, and Ronald Reagan is the standard bearer of what Richard Nixon left behind. Theodore White the great historian who writes about the making of presidents, I say great historian with tongue in chief, she said in quotes, California is a state with the oddest political structure in the union. There is no party organization in the older American sense. California politics squirm with a complexity intri and intrigue that defies reasonable analysis. He wrote that in February of 1956. I take issue with people like Theodore White and praise uh, men like Charles Spears, and there aren't many of them like Charles Spears, because these complexities and intrigues do not defy analysis. These people uh, that are involved in this great drama of history have names and places, meeting places, where they go, and they can be checked out, who they see or what they do. And uh, the man who's catapulted into a position of President of the United States, such as Ronald Reagan, has roots. And if you look for them, you can find them. And you can find then who he's going to serve if he gets into office. Reagan didn't come out of a vacuum. Earl Warren didn't come out of a vacuum. In California, from Kern County, Bakersfield, to become Chief Justice, he was discovered by Murray Chotner, with links to organized crime, who discovered Richard Nixon and the same people that funded Nixon against Jerry Voorhees and Helen Douglas. Then Nixon was vice president. Uh, they had Ronnie Baby waiting in the sidelines to put into the next position. Uh, this uh, explanation of Theodore White refuses to get into the world of organized crime, of narcotics, of the links of people like Robert Besco, the arms merchants, the influence of Randolph Hearst, and broadcasting and propaganda that defy uh, the simplicity that these people are simply complex and that we never can find the truth about them. It's all there if you want to see it. In 1960, this was uh, just four or five years before Ronald Reagan decided to become governor, the John Birch Society was growing. Again, in California, the roots of the Birch Society. Uh, it's true that Robert Mayhew, who worked with closely with the use organization, CIA, counterintelligence, and FBI was meeting in New York to hire John Roselli, Sam Giacana, and the mobsters to work for the CIA with an assassination team. But Mayu moved west, and Mayu worked for Howard Hughes, and Howard Hughes' offices, the Hughes aircraft, were in California, even though he moved into Vegas, or the operation moved into Vegas. The Romaine Street headquarters were the Hughes headquarters, and California was the branch of his counterintelligence activity. And Dr. Fred Schwartz moved uh, to California, I believe he was from Australia, led his Christian anti-communism crusade at the Hollywood Bowl. 12,000 people came to California. The strong Christian crusade that's developing in Texas now with people behind the assassination of John Kennedy uh, that covered it up, Leon Jaworski and Gerald Ford, John Connolly, the Clint Merchinson family, these various people, uh, Clement Stone, behind the Christian crusade got the impetus from California again with Fred Schwartz and the Birch Society and John Rousselet. Uh, a member of the Birch Society, Mr. Oliver, was in Boston giving a speech saying that all the Jews in America and the world should be vaporized. But Oliver worked closely with Rousselet in California, and in 1962, uh, Ronald Reagan was speaking for Rousselet and beginning to be known as a far-right fundamentalist at uh, these anti-communist crusades, these Christian crusades. Ronald Reagan was working for Rousselet's campaign giving a speech called what's at stake. He was Henry Salvatore, the oil man that was behind Nixon's career, began to fund Reagan, a man named A.C. Rubel from Union Oil, George Murphy, the actor working for Technicolor, and Patrick Frawley, 
The right wing in California ranged from the extreme fundamentalists and the church to the Minutemen and the Nazi parties. Salvatore was working a long time with Nixon and Reagan. He supported Schwartz and the anti-communist crusade. The Birch Society was supporting Billy James Hargis and Gerald Smith. And Walter Knott from Knott's Berry Farm was behind the Birch Society and Hargis. Uh, Ronald Reagan's support came from the fundamentalist Christian group that were favoring apartheid in South Africa. They favor sending nuclear weapons to South Africa right now. They are very anti-Semitic. They are uh, anti-black. They are very closely associated with the Nazis and the Minutemen. Uh, Spencer Roberts, the association that represented Ronald Reagan, had a problem in 1964. They admitted they had to sell Reagan as a moderate while he was linked to the right-wing extremists. So that while they represented Rousselet in the Birch Society and Representative Bell in Congress, they had to handle Reagan's campaign for governor and push into power a man never before did we have an actor as a governor in California and never before a person without experience in public office. Their uh, reason for taking the case of Reagan was the extenuating circumstance of his uh, mobility and exposure through General Electric. Regan came from Tampico, Illinois, a little town. He went to a college of 250 students. And some of his Christian fundamentalism may be caused by the fact that he was poor. His father was an alcoholic, and the church gave him his education. He didn't go to any of the top schools, the New, East, New England schools, like Lyndon Johnson. There was this, uh, I did it for myself versus the Ivy League. The polished East Coast people looked down on these Western boobs and these self uh, people that brought themselves up by their bootstraps. Uh, no matter how hard it was, Regan was in there washing dishes and a lifeguard at the swimming pools and so forth. He was bringing home a drunk father, an alcoholic, and his mother had a sense of drama. She loved poetry and plays, and she worked hard, and uh, he went to Hollywood in 1937. He graduated from this religious college, and a person, Joy Hodges, a singer from Des Moines, Iowa, took him to Hollywood. Now, his career catapulted so fast from being a radio announcer. He was working with the Cubs in Chicago and then went to Catalina Island. But uh, I don't know anything about Joy Hodges, but she took him to a man named Bill Mickeljohn in 1937. Now, 37 historically was the time that Hitler was really swinging. He'd been in power four years. It was two years before he invaded Poland. It was a time when the United States was very pro-Nazi. Very many public officials were for Hitler. Uh, uh, even people like Lindbergh, our great American hero, didn't think we could win the war, that we should become German, the British should, could become German. A lot of people were sympathetic to Adolf Hitler, and Hollywood was run by a group of Mongols who uh, thought that any improvement in wages in the studios meant communism or socialism, and they were violently anti-communist. And Reagan began to uh, line up. He lost what was a liberal state of mind when he first came to Hollywood. He began to line up with the far right wing when he saw that his movie career was declining, that he was useful to the extreme right wing. But he was taken to a Mikkel John for a test where he landed immediately 200 a week, which is interesting, and made headlines in the social, in the register in Des Moines. Dutch Regan, local sports announcer, signed a long-term contract with Warner Brothers. Now, whether they had eye on Regan, just as Errol Flynn was a Nazi spy for the Gestapo, whether Regan worked with people who were later going to use him as a sleeper and watch his uh, rise to power, you know, give him some good movie parts and then swing him to General Electric and push him for a later campaign, whether his career was that consciously fo or followed or not, I don't know. I think we would only know if we know who Joy Hodges was, who her contacts were, and who Bill Michael John was, and whether or not they had any links with purposes later where they could pull Regan out and use him. Because obviously Regan never had to know anything or make any decisions, and he was a perfect cover during all these years while mind control and the COINTEL program and the domestic activities of the intelligence community were going on massively in his state, probably more than any other state in the Union. During the war years, he didn't fight. 
he made a couple of movies, and he worked at a desk at Culver City. It was called the Culver City Commandos. It was a motion picture unit of the Army Air Corps. They synchronized battle action on the screen, and he signed it off saying, bombs away. That's where he, why he wears that silly veteran's hat when he speaks to the veterans' organizations, because he had the privilege of watching them being slain on the film and narrating the movies as propaganda, I guess, for better fighters to enlist and go overseas. He made a couple of movies during the war years. Newt Rockney in 1940, that was just prior to our entering the war in King's Row in 1941. After that, his movies weren't very great, and uh, he was looking for something, and politics seemed to fill the bill. The last movies from 1947 to 57 were bad. In fact, they were terrible. But General Electric used his face and his voice, and they began to sell anti-communism and sell America and use uh, Ronald Reagan for that role. They, as I say, they sent him around the country. He had massive exposure, 135 plants. He met the executives, the personnel. He was a bigwig for the National Association of Manufacturers, which was very pro-fascist and pro-Hitler and the Chamber of Commerce of the United States. They loved Reagan. He built a national political base later to head the state of California by traveling for General Electric and other corporations. Every year he visited these places and then they heard his voice on radio. They saw reruns on the television on the screen. And by 1964, that Goldwater image was too harsh and in comes Ronald Reagan. His brother, Neil, sends him to see Goldwater, and then the agencies took over from there. He was active with the House on american Activities. He began getting in on the witch hunt, and also, as his politics changed, he divorced Jane Wyman. They were married and had several children, and uh, according to Wyman and the people around him, they said, in quotes, Ronald got involved with a new political obsession. He entered the conservative side of the pol political spectrum, and that's when Nancy came to his side. She was from the Eastern uh, College, Smith College. She brought the veneer and culture that Reagan needed to accompany him if he was to be the governor of California, and Nancy was the daughter of a doctor in Chicago, Illinois, the part of town that Reagan never got to. Uh, Nancy is a strong influence in his life. She gave him, according to some articles, security and support and established him with the wealthy crowd. She knew how to entertain. She knew who to exclude. And she was that veneer and polish from the other part of town, as I say, the Smith College, that he never could visit or see. Uh, so the combination of the public exposure around the country and the classical, uh, the wife, I guess pouring the tea on the right tea service and so forth and entertaining the very rich was just what Ronald Reagan needed to be entertained in the homes of the very, very wealthy that he was to represent and get contracts for later in his life. I got interested in Ronald Reagan when I was studying the Kennedy assassination. I mentioned last week or the week before how a man who worked for the CIA and FBI, Mr. Ducote, was also working with agents of Ronald Reagan's in California when uh, Reagan was the governor. Uh, the first expose on the Kennedy assassination, the first article or magazine to really come out with an expose was Ramparts Magazine, November 1964. There's a picture of John Kennedy on the cover in a crossword puzzle. And I helped write that article. David Welsh came to my home, and I purposely left my name out of there because I didn't want to be hassled while I was doing serious research. This was in 1966, and by 1967, according to the FBI reports, or actually they did it in 1966, I was under surveillance. Anyway, in 1968, Ramparts came out with another explosive article on the Kennedy assassination with Jim Garrison's picture on the cover. Bill Turner, a former FBI agent who uh, disliked J. Edgar Hoover's black bag jobs and left the FBI, was a staff writer for Ramparts magazine, and he helped write the uh, exposés on the Kennedy assassination. And as I mentioned uh, last week, this Jerry Ducote, who was working for the Young Repair Republicans Club, was burglarizing the Ramparts offices and turning over the information to the Central Intelligence Agency. Besides the Oakland Peace Center and the United Farm Workers, they were specifically uh, sending him 
to steal the papers and working papers from Ramparts where they were exposing the assassination of John Kennedy and uh, writing articles about the involvement of the FBI and the CIA in the Kennedy assassination. When Ducote uh, spoke about the burglaries and the information being given to the CIA and working with members of Regan's staff in California who also knew about these burglaries that he was doing, FBI agent Charles Bates denied that the FBI was in any way involved in political burglaries. He made this disclaimer uh, before. Uh, he was in San Francisco working for the FBI, but the COINTEL program had come out, and before the uh, news people could add, paper people could even attempt to link the FBI to the kidnapping of Patty Hearst, uh, Charles Bates, how he kept his credibility, I don't know, was denying the black bag jobs into ramparts and other places. But Ducote said he was turning over his information to the FBI in San Francisco. Ducote also burglarized Ramparts magazine for a group called Western Research. They put up the money for his burglarizing those offices when they were doing work into who killed John Kennedy. And he said the money that went into Western Research came from Southern Pacific, from Pacific Gas and Electric Company, from Lockheed Aircraft, from Standard Oil of California. It was a security pool that gathered information about possible subversives. And they were turning this information over to members of Reagan's staff, and Ronald Reagan and his staff knew that these burglaries were taking place and uh, that Ramparts was exposing the role of the FBI and CIA in the killing of John Kennedy. Ronald Reagan was asked in June 1968 about uh, the slaying of Robert Kennedy because it took place in California, June 14th. Ronald Reagan was interviewed in Indianapolis, Indiana, and he attributed the assassination of Robert Kennedy to violent war in the Middle East that Sirhan was imported. Because, he said, we're not a sick society. There's a war in the Middle East and it's, we should get angry because this man was brought over from the Middle East to kill Robert Kennedy. And then Ronald Reagan said, President Kennedy was done by one who embraced the godless philosophy of communism. It was a communist violence that brought, was brought to our land. He was referring to Oswald, the killer of John Kennedy, because he once lived in the Soviet Union. And uh, he had interviews. Ronald Reagan never hesitated to refer to Lee Harvey Oswald as the communist that killed John Kennedy. Now, the man, one of the men that put Ronald Reagan into power was Patrick Frawley of Technicolor and Chick, Ra Chick Razorblades. And Frawley had a man working for him who was in Army Intelligence named Ed Butler. And Ed Butler made the record down in New Orleans with Lee Harvey Oswald. Oswald worked for Navy Intelligence and for the FBI. And as a cover, appearing pro-Castro because he wanted to get into Cuba and he was told to infiltrate Cuba, he made a record in New Orleans saying that he was a Marxist. It was a kind of a mind control, repetitive, quite brilliant record of Lee Harvey Oswald's I'm a Marxist. And it was produced by Ed Butler. Ed Butler worked with Patrick Frawley. After the assassination, Ed Butler moved to California to be with Frawley and continued the Marxist story that John Kennedy was killed by a communist and a Marxist. And the very man who was behind the escalation of Ronald Reagan's career also uh, was working and hiring Ed Butler, who worked with Lee Harvey Oswald in New Orleans. Well, Bill Turner, who had worked with the FBI, as I said before, worked with Ramparts, wrote a book on California in particular called Power on the Right, published by Ramparts Press. And in this book, he has many references to the people around Ronald Reagan and the Minutemen and the far right, the buildup in California, and the links to the assassinations that Bill Turner was studying with his expertise as a former FBI man. He got into groups such as Depew and the Minutemen into the anti-Castro Cuban group. He helped Jim Garrison in New Orleans, and he was familiar with the very people that were behind the assassination of John Kennedy members of the Birch Society, Major General Edwin Walker, um, men that hated John Kennedy, and it, it was an anti-Catholic as well as an anti-Kennedy mania they had. This Christian crusade is 
an anti-Catholic crusade. They are linked with Catholics at a certain level, but basically the anti-communist crusade is also anti-Catholic. Ronald Reagan is a Catholic fronting for them, which is interesting enough, but there is also a religious split. While they're using Ronald Reagan as their front, there is this anti-Catholic feeling running through a lot of their literature. And in the book on the uh, power on the right, uh, Bill Turner writes about meetings in California of the anti-Castro Cubans and the Christian Defense League and a man named G. Clinton Wheat, a member of the Klan, and they met with Eugene Hall, who was in uh, Dealey Plaza, part of the Kennedy assassination, and with Oswald's double, a man that was at Sylvia Odio's home and William Seymour, and various people. They had meetings in Los Angeles with the people, Lawrence Howard and William Seymour. They met in Los Angeles with people that were also associated with Ronald Reagan, and there was a group that incorporated Eugene Bradley and Dr. Stanley Drennan, and they worked with Dr. Carl McIntyre. And when it was time for uh, Eugene Bradley to be brought to New Orleans to be questioned by Jim Garrison because he met with these anti-Castro Cubans that had talked about the plans to kill John Kennedy, Ronald Reagan refused to extradite Eugene Bradley. He said, I'm not going to send him for a witch hunt, and he, as governor, refused to approve the extradition, even though Bradley worked with the no-name key group, the CIA group, in uh, summer of 63 in Florida. They worked with the Oswald Doubles. They worked with the National States Rights Party in Los Angeles. Uh, these people were behind the Reagan campaign. They worked hard for the people behind Reagan, and Reagan would not extradite Bradley, even though he had a major contact with people suspected of killing John Kennedy and being very ver verbal about the desire to kill John Kennedy. The uh, church leagues, the very uh, National Church Council was attacked by the Church League, the American Legion, the American Revolutionary Forces, the Air Force Association, all began to use Ronald Reagan and to have him speak for them. And he became the front man for uh, their uh, criticisms of the welfare system. He gave lectures on uh, Ronald Reagan on the welfare state. He was hitting the welfare state. And the Christian crusade was attacking any kind of a cooperative system that was other than what they called the American free enterprise system. There was no consideration of the poor, the uh, underprivileged, the uh, the lame, the blind, the deaf, the mentally retarded. Ronald Reagan served these people well by consolidating agencies and cutting back money for this large middle class that uh, the same group that Adolf Hitler attacked as soon as he was in power. The people behind Reagan, as I say, were boosting the parathroid of South Africa, and they kept files on everybody. They kept large files. The Church League had 3,000 3 by 5 cross-index files on organizations that they thought were communist, and they combined these with the FBI files. And they have these data banks going now uh, connected to uh, organizations in Florida I want to go into later. We won't have time next week. The Wackenhut Corporation and also Johnny Meyer, who worked for Howard Hughes at the Los Angeles Police Department, had a direct computer link into the files in Utah. Anti-war protesters, if you want an abortion, if you signed a petition. I guess if you signed petition for nuclear energy or demonstrate, in California or whatever. All this information is set into data banks for future use. These people aren't going to come down lightly someday. They brag about miles and miles of files. And behind Ronald Reagan's administration, when he was governor in the state, there were photographs of 20, 30,000 people taken by the Army and the CIA and put into these files, which they later admitted they had on microfilm. Uh, the image of the calm, cool, friendly, kindly governor was anything but that. But people outside of the state can't realize how much pain was going on because newspapers across the country didn't really carry very much except for a few shockers such as the Manson family and a few large um, violences in California. Rockefeller handled the demonstrations at Attica uh, the way he saw fit by having the guards and the prisoners gunned down and the remaining tortured out in the fields. And Ronald Reagan had his violences. And next week, 
I'm going to run down some of the California violences and the role Ronald Reagan had in them. Uh, the COINTEL program was established. It was very efficient. It began in the late 60s. Reagan was governor in 66, and Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon uh, began this system of keeping track of people, of crashing their skulls, of uh, bringing in the Hells Angels to break open the peace demonstrations, bring in violence, and to break up what was beginning to be called a flower power where young people were against the Vietnam War, were against the killing, and uh, had assembled together, left home in large masses to uh, express their feelings and sentiments. They had not known World War I or II. They didn't know much about it. But instinctively, they didn't like the war in Southeast Asia, and they didn't want to fight the war in Southeast Asia. I think that was 80 percent of the problem, and I think that's why they dropped out of political involvement later, was that they simply didn't want to fight the war, and they didn't want their friends to go. Uh, it was less a social historical movement, and that's why it failed, because if they really had feelings for Southeast Asia, they wouldn't have stopped fighting. The suffering is still going on in Cambodia and Laos. And Ronald Reagan uh, financed with a lot of money the Christian Anti-Communism Crusade. The Anti-Communist Voters League poured money into him, the National Strategy Committee of the American Security Council. They were putting money into Ronald Reagan. And somebody asked the question about Ronald Reagan, what will he do when he's governor? He's only an actor. And Henry Salvatore said, I'll tell him what to do. He's got to listen. So that Patrick Frawley and Salvatore and Mr. Rubell and Tuttle and Walter Knott knew that they would tell Ronald Reagan what to do. The American Security Council, the Birch Society, H.L. Hunt, uh, these organizations plus Spencer Roberts public relations firm were to put him into power. The Young Americans for Freedom was forming. The Birch Society was very active. They could write the speeches and he could attack institutions that had begun to be built up through a legitimate social change uh, during the Roosevelt period and after the war. The changes in society that uh, John Kennedy dreamed about, the civil rights movement bringing in troops, to uh, let the Meredith be educated at a college in the South, to let blacks get education, was to come to a standstill. Next week on the tape, I'm going to talk about Ronald Reagan's role in the education system of depriving us of uh, full education in the state of California, and then it followed suit in other places. The people behind him enjoyed the Hell's Angel at the Oakland Army Induction Center plowing into the peace people and breaking up the crowds, just taking motorcycles and going into them. Governor Ronald Reagan liked that. He said these people were lay lending aid and comfort to the enemy and let the Hells Angels work with the police department to break up those people. That's why Hells Angel leader Sonny Barger isn't in jail today, because he served the federal government all along. Our time is up now. It's hardly an hour on Ronald Reagan. Next week, I will get back to some more on Ronald Reagan, but for the time being, that's all the time we have. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California. You have a good week, and I'll be with you next week.